Well, good morning. Man, happy Mother's Day uh, to all our mothers, and we sure are glad that you're here today. And uh, what a great day to worship the Lord, right? Yeah, it's a good day to be here. Let me give you a few announcements uh, before we get started uh, this morning. Um, if you'll look there in your bulletin, uh, you have a flyer, and uh, on that flyer uh, is uh, the information about the baby bottle boomerang. So uh, we're starting that uh, today, uh, as we typically do. Uh, Mother's Day, we pass out the baby bottles, and Father's Day, we collect them. And so uh, you can pick you up a bottle, one, two, three, four, five, however many you want to get, and uh, you fill them up with change, and, um, and then you bring them back, and that goes to our Lawrence uh, County Center uh, for Pregnancy Choices. Uh, they do a, a great ministry, a great work there uh, for, for mothers, and, uh, and we're so proud of, so, to be a part of that ministry. And so uh, pick up your baby bottle today and uh, start uh, filling it up. Uh, also, um, I'm excited about this. Uh, this year, our uh, summer uh, food program for kids is, is coming back around, and the, the information is there in, uh, on, the, on the other side of that flyer. And uh, <clears throat> we're anticipating about 10 bags of food that we'll be delivering uh, each week, beginning June the 1st and going through July the 31st. And uh, this is our, is this about our third year, Misty? About our third year to, uh, uh, to, to do this, and, it, and it's gone real well. It's been a great blessing, and uh, uh, last year and last couple of years, uh, we've had a lot of people, a lot of you within the church, uh, a part of packing bags, delivering bags, uh, and, and doing a great job. So wonderful ministry to be a part of. Uh, you can uh, pick up your items that you're going to get, uh, deliver them to the fellowship hall there, and, um, and we'll have them uh, stored up, and then uh, there'll be a sign-up for people who want to pack and people who want to deliver uh, throughout the summer. And so, um, looking forward to, to that. If you're interested in our uh, mission trip to Kentucky, uh, the dates are in there, June the 9th to the 13th. Uh, toward the end of this month, I'll have uh, some more specifics for you. Um, but as of right now, we're going to be doing some construction projects. Uh, they also would like uh, some folks to help with Bible school. Uh, while we're up there uh, at night, they're going to be doing Bible school from Thursday night uh, through Saturday night. And uh, they would like folks to help with Bible school. Uh, mainly they need uh, just teachers and workers, uh, you know, those uh, to help with Bible school. They already kind of have their Bible school planned or organized, so to speak. Uh, they would just need some helpers. And so if you'd like to go with us and help with Bible school, uh, that would be great. Um, and then also uh, construction projects that we'll be doing or in relation to the flood damage that they, that they received here uh, a couple of months ago. And so that's June the 9th uh, through the 13th. And then uh, the last thing I want to mention to you is uh, baby dedication. Uh, we, we moved baby dedication, actually last year, but COVID kind of messed that up. Uh, but it, it's always been on Mother's Day, and uh, we, we decided uh, that we would move that and put it on its own day so the babies would have their own day. Isn't that good, babies? Amen. Aaron's speaking for all the babies. They happy to have their own day, right? And so, um, so that's going to be June the 6th. And so we'd like for you to sign up. And uh, there's always information uh, to fill out uh, uh, for your children to be a part of that service. And so uh, go ahead and uh, get, that, get that in so we can start planning our baby dedication uh, service. Also, just a, a quick mention, uh, throw this out there at you. Uh, July the 4th is on a Sunday this year. And uh, we're planning a uh, patriotic day uh, service uh, from Sunday school. Uh, we're going to have uh, some special teaching on, on God and the Constitution. Uh, then also um, we're going to have a patriotic worship service. And then we're having a uh, patriotic day afterwards. We're going to have a picnic, church picnic, and, uh, and all of that that afternoon. And so we're looking forward uh, to having a good day of uh, 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 celebrating the foundation of our country and, uh, and a good patriotic day. That's July the 4th. So just wanted you to be aware of that. Any other announcements you need to make? All right. They look excited, Miss Denise. So let's get going. If you will stand with us. We'll start with our call to worship. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. You will turn to 705 and sing with me, It Is Well With My Soul. We'll sing the first and the last.
Lord, I thank you so much that it can be well with our soul because of your grace and your love, because of your willingness to leave heaven and come to this sin-sick world, Lord, to die on that old rugged cross for our sin, Lord, to save us, to forgive us, and to give us, Lord, life and life eternally. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done so that it can be well with our soul. And today, Lord, we celebrate you today. And today we celebrate, Lord, uh, your plan for our lives, your plan for family, Lord, your plan for mothers and for children. Lord, we celebrate you today. And I pray, God, that you would bless us and speak into our hearts your word. And I pray, God, that uh, we would be drawn close to you today, Lord, that, that we might live by faith, that we might stand apart, Lord, uh, from this world, and that the light of Christ might shine, Lord, in our hearts and in our homes and in our community, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be a church that's based upon the foundation of your word and, and Lord, that shares your love and your truth, Lord, uh, with our community and with our world. So thank you for this day of worship. Bless our hearts, convict us, Lord, challenge us, and bring us to that point of being in the center of your will that our lives might glorify you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Had a wonderful time uh, this morning of, um, of recognizing our mothers uh, today. And as we get started, I, I'm reminded of this, this young mother, and she was walking out of the store with her little four-year-old daughter. And uh, the little girl reached down at, uh, in the parking lot, and she picked up a piece of candy that had been on, on the ground. And she went to put it in her mouth, and of course the mother replied, No, 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 don't do that. And then, of course, you can imagine what the response was. Why? Right? Why? And so at this point, mom begins to explain. Because it's been outside a long time, it's dirty, it probably has a lot of germs on it. So the little girl looks at her mom in admiration and she says, Wow, how do you know all this stuff? Well, mom thinking kind of quickly, she says, well, all moms know this stuff. It's, uh, it's on the mommy test. You have to know it or they don't let you be a mommy. And they walked along a, a little bit further and, you know, the little girl's wheels are turning and she's thinking and all of a sudden a little light bulb comes on and she, after she's kind of pondered this information and she says, oh, I get it. So if you flunk the test, you have to be a daddy. Ouch. Thank you, mothers, for the love that you put into our lives every day. You know, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love does not keep a record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. For love never fails. So moms today, thank you for your unfailing love in our lives. Your love that always perseveres. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Um, at this point, uh, we would like to ask our children uh, to come forward. And so all of our kids, if y'all would come on down here. Right here to this spot by the piano would be great. So if y'all would come on down. Follow instructions, good. Right by the piano. <laughs>
I think we're ready. So we'd like to ask uh, all our moms if you would stand uh, this morning for us. And uh, as you receive your gift this morning, uh, if you would be seated after you receive your gift.
Now for our offertory hymn, if you will stand with me. We're going to sing this song today in memory of Miss Mary Frances Cupid. Um, this was one of her, her most favorite songs for us to sing, and it's precious memory. So join me today in remembering Miss Mary Frances. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning. I just, uh, I praise you and I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the mother that I had. And I thank you for Christian mothers, Lord. And I just pray, Father, a special blessing upon them. And as Father, as we've seen all these kids here this morning, I just thank you. I thank you for them, Lord. I thank you for mothers and daddies that bring them to church. Lord, our prayer is that uh, we nurture them and your love and your admiration, Father. And we just pray, Father, that as a church, that we continue to lift up our mothers and we continue, Father, to support them. And, Lord, I just thank you again for Christian mothers and just ask for your guidance and your blessings upon them, Father. And, Lord, I lift up our pastor to you this morning, Father, and I just pray, Lord, for his the words today that he speaks brings you honor and glory, Father. And may they be in spirit and in truth, Lord. And may we take them and we'll apply them to our lives, Father, and have a closer walk with you. And, Lord, just please take this part of the service. Use it for the furtherment of your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
just beautiful. Thank you, Miss Rochelle. I asked Mama if there was a certain song she wanted me to sing today for, for Mother's Day, and um, she picked uh, Roses Will Bloom Again. Uh, I don't know what's going on with my voice this morning, but hopefully I can make it through it and do it justice. But, you know, um, praise God we have the hopes that we have when we're believers in Jesus Christ that um, there's always going to be a better day for us no matter what's going on you know, because we have the promises from our Lord and Savior. And thank you, Denise, uh, for that wonderful song. You know, that song, Precious Memories, uh, we, we're reminded, too, uh, of the wonderful mothers and grandmothers that have gone on to be with the Lord. 
that, that we say thank you for their influence in our lives as, as well uh, today. And I know, um, I know I remember and I appreciate my grandmothers uh, so much and in, in their investment in my life and their influence in my life. And I know that uh, many of you uh, feel the same way about your uh, mothers and grandmothers that have gone on uh, to be with the Lord. Uh, influence, that's what I want us to talk about this morning, a godly influence. So if you'll turn to 2 Timothy and if you'll open up to Acts 16. So you've got a multitask here for just a few moments, 2 Timothy and Acts uh, 16. As you get going there, uh, let's think about the influence of a mother for just a few moments. My mother taught me religion. She said, you better pray that I come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught me about logic. If you fall out of that swing and break your leg, don't come running to me. My mother taught me about irony. Keep on crying and I'll give you something to cry about. My mother taught me a little bit about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. My mother taught me a little bit about the weather. Your room looks like a tornado came through here. My mother also taught me some about hypocrisy. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times, don't exaggerate. My mother taught me a little bit about envy. There are millions of less fortunate children in this world who don't have wonderful parents like you do. My mother also taught me some about anticipation. You just wait until your father gets home. My mom taught me some about medical advice. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're going to get stuck that way. My mom taught me some about my roots. She said, shut that door behind you. Do you think you grew up in a barn? My mom also taught me a little bit about justice. One day you'll have kids and I hope they turn out to be just like you. Right? The influence of a mother. It is a powerful influence upon the character development and the direction of a child's life. That's the old statement. The hand that rocks the cradle does what? The influence of a mother, a godly influence. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it, moms? I mean, that is a lot of pressure. It is pressure to be a mother. Pressure to be perfect. Pressure to be this definition of a good mother, so to speak. But there are two impossible jobs to motherhood. And of course, this is from the outside looking in, since I'm not a mother... But there are two impossible jobs to motherhood. And the first is this. It's impossible to be perfect. It's impossible to be perfect. There are no perfect mothers. And we don't raise perfect children. I mean, we are sinners saved by grace. And we live in a fallen world. And so it is impossible to be perfect. It is also impossible to ensure outcomes. It's impossible to ensure outcomes. You can't control every step in your child's life. You can't make every choice for them no matter how hard you try. And you can't ensure the outcome of who they will become and what they will do. That's two impossible jobs. You can't be perfect. You can't ensure all the outcomes. But what you can do is you can leave a godly influence in the life of your child and your grandchild. Let's think about Timothy this morning, the young man from Scripture. Timothy's name means honoring God, honoring God. Now, I would say that if most of us, if most of us would submit our desired outcome for our children, we would say that that would sum it up. You know, I, I would desire for my child to honor God with their life, to live a life that glorifies God. A Christian godly parent, that is basically the desired outcome. I, I pray, I desire for my child to honor God and to glorify God with their life. 
whatever that they do. Timothy, Timothy was a young man from the city of Lystra. He became a believer in his childhood through the witness and through the testimony of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. He grew in his faith as a young man so much that even as an as a older teenager and a, a young man, he was respected by all of the churches and by the believers in the area in which he lived. They knew him. He had a good reputation as a follower of Christ. So good that in Acts chapter 16, when the Apostle Paul came through the city again on his second missionary journey, he chose Timothy to be his traveling companion and a co-worker in the ministry with him. Timothy would work alongside Paul, representing Paul to these early churches and also instructing these early churches. Timothy worked in the church plants of Philippi, Corinth, in Ephesus and Thessalonica. He eventually, later in his life, became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Timothy was known for his sincere faith, his loving service, and his faithful commitment to the work of the Lord. And I want you to just make a check here. Timothy was instrumental in the growth of the early church throughout the ancient world. He had a major impact as a co-worker of Paul. Paul would call him his true son in the faith as Paul was his mentor and Timothy grew in faith under Paul and served under the, under the mentorship of Paul. However, the godly influence in Timothy's life from an early age came from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They played a major role in shaping his life, influencing his faith, and laying the foundation of faith in Timothy's life. And so I want to look this morning at two keys to being a godly influence upon our children and within our family. Two keys for influencing our children toward honoring God in their life and fulfilling God's will in their life. So let's look first at 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we begin with verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now, just a little side note. The book of 2 Timothy is known as a pastoral letter. Paul only wrote three. He wrote 1 Timothy... About 10 years later, 2 Timothy, he also wrote Titus as well. These were pastoral letters. They were personal letters from Paul to his companions, his co-workers in the ministry. All right? 2 Timothy is the last book written in Paul's life. So it's his last words. And it is to Timothy, who is the pastor of Ephesus, encouraging him in his continued ministry there and his continued work of the Lord. So we're reading Paul's last words. Paul wrote these words while he was in prison in Rome and he would eventually be martyred there. So let's look at what Paul has to say to Timothy. It's very interesting. So I am reminded, Paul says, verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. So Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith. And then he he gives you the pattern. It was first, the sincere faith was first in your grandmother Lois, then your mother Eunice, and now it is in you. This godly influence has been passed on. And so the first thing I want you to see about godly influence is this. Godly influence requires a sincere faith in your life. A sincere faith. Now, we're not told exactly how Lois and Eunice came to faith in Christ. But we're pretty sure that that took place in Acts chapter 14 on Paul's first missionary journey to Lystra. From there, more than likely, they received Christ in their life And they began to spread that faith to their family. Paul tells us Lois became a believer first, and then Eunice, and then through their influence, Timothy as a child came to faith. They nurtured him in the faith as well. Now go to Acts chapter 16. 
So turn to Acts chapter 16 with me. Now in Acts chapter 16, you're going to find Paul's second missionary journey, and he comes through Timothy's town of Lystra. And then you're going to get a glimpse of Timothy's family situation here in Acts chapter 16. So Paul came to Derbe, beginning in verse 1, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because the Jews who lived in that area, they all knew that his father was a Greek. So let's look at Timothy's family situation for just a few moments. We see that his mother Eunice was a Jewish believer. More than likely, Lois was her mother, and she was a Jewish believer as well. But what does the Scripture say here? Don't miss this. Eunice was married to a Greek man. This was an interracial marriage. This was a mixed marriage. She was Jewish. He was Greek. And on top of that, the Bible doesn't say, as it says in other places of Gentiles, that they were God-fearers. So here, Timothy's father was an unbeliever. In Lystra, the god Zeus and Hermes were worshipped. There was a large temple right outside of Lystra to Zeus. You find that in Acts chapter 14. So more than likely, Timothy's father was a worshiper of Zeus and Hermes. So the question is, how'd they get married? Because Jews strictly forbid marrying outside of Judaism. Jews strictly forbid mixed marriages. A good Jew would never marry a Gentile or a Greek. So when you think about that situation, it is very possible that Eunice was not a faithful Jew. She was not living in obedience uh, to her Jewish law, her Jewish tradition as a young woman. She was possibly living in rebellion before her conversion to Christ. We can only speculate. We don't know for sure. But what you see here in this situation is believing mother, believing grandmother, unbelieving father. Now, at this particular time, this particular time when Timothy comes along, and I mean, when Paul comes along, and Timothy is a late teen, we realize that either Timothy's father is no longer in the picture, either through death or through divorce, or either possibly just through a disconnection. So either his father has zero influence in that situation, or either his father's still there and he has a negative influence in the situation. Either way, whatever the situation was, it was a challenging, complicated family situation. It was definitely not perfect. Timothy was not raised in a perfect Christian home. Now, Lois and Eunice, because of that situation... They had to step up. They had to be the spiritual leaders for Timothy. Now, side note. Men, this is not politically correct, but men have been ordained by God to be the spiritual leaders of their home. When you go to Scripture, it is not the responsibility of the woman to raise the child in the Scriptures. It is not the responsibility of the woman to raise the kids. It is the responsibility of the man to make sure that the kids are instructed in the Lord, know the Lord, and are able to live for the Lord. It is the responsibility of the man. God made Adam first. That means it is the man's responsibility to lead his family in the ways of the Lord, not the woman's. That's the way God has structured it. In this situation, it's less than perfect. Because Timothy's father is an unbeliever. He's a pagan worshiper. And so the responsibility fell upon Lois and upon Eunice to train up Timothy. Now, 
What do we do in situations where you have a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse? Well, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you'll find specific instructions for that purpose. In that particular passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says that the, un, that the believing spouse should not leave or divorce the unbelieving spouse unless that unbelieving spouse willingly leaves and abandons the relationship. In 1 Timothy, I mean 1 Peter, excuse me, in 1 Peter chapter 3, you will find Peter instruct this. He instructs the believing wife to stay with the unbelieving husband, but to pray for them and to display before them a life of purity and reverence so that the unbelieving spouse may see Christ in them and believe, become a believer. Timothy puts it this way, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, even if they're not believers, that they may be one without word by the conduct of their wives. And so there's specific instruction given. Now, although we don't know the dynamics of Timothy's family, we see that Lois and Eunice had a sincere faith. What does that word sincere mean? It means unhypocritical. They were not hypocrites. In other words, they didn't go to church and pretend to be one way and live another way at home. They didn't put on a mask. They didn't put on a, a face. They didn't pretend to be one thing and live out another. They were genuine. They were sincere in their commitment to Christ their commitment to their family, and their commitment to the church, to the other believers. And no doubt, the little eyes of Timothy watched his grandmother and his mother as they sought the Lord, as they prayed for God's will and God's guidance, as they loved Him, as they loved others, and as they trusted the Lord to work all things together for the good. And so in Acts chapter 16... We find that Timothy had accepted Christ at a very early age. He had grown in his faith. And by the time he was a teenager, he was living faithfully for the Lord, so faithfully that others in the church took notice. He had a good reputation. When Paul came along, what did Paul do? Paul said, man, he saw the gift in Timothy, and he said, I want him to work with me. And, they took, and he took him along. Now, what do we see? with Eunice. Eunice's name basically means victorious. Eunice's name means victorious. And by her sincere faith, she overcame the challenges within her home and she influenced Timothy's life. And I imagine when, she, when Timothy set sail as a young man with Paul, she stood rejoicing that God was fulfilling his purpose in Timothy's life. Don't you think so? She had to be a proud mama and a proud grandmother. You know, it reminds me a little bit about a story that I read a long time ago, and I never forgot it. This, this bad storm blew up, and, and the little boy, he was scared to death. And so he kept coming to his door. You know, Mama, I'm scared. She's like, just get back in bed. You know, you'll be okay. And then she pulled out that spiritual card. She told him, she said, Son, I know, I know it's scary, but just get back in bed. Jesus is with you. Right? And so the little boy said, Yes, ma'am, I know Jesus is with me, but right now, Mama, I need somebody with some skin on. And isn't that what your children need? Your children need the gospel with skin on it. They need to see you live by a sincere faith. That's what makes a difference in their life. How do we do that? Let me share with you several things that are essential to sincere faith. The first is this. You have to seek first the kingdom of God as a parent. You have to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness in your life. Your children cannot be your God. Your children can't be your God. Your spouse cannot be your God. Your home cannot be your God. Your career cannot be your God. Sincere faith starts with you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness 
in your life, Matthew 6, 33. But sincere faith also calls for us to pray without ceasing, to pray with your children, to pray over your children, to pray for your children. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, pray without ceasing. Ceasing. You know, in the Gospels, when you read that account, you see parents consistently bringing their children to Jesus. And sometimes it is in the most dire circumstances. Sometimes you see parents bringing Jesus to their children. Lord, my child's about to die. Lord, Lord, my child has been suffering from this spirit. You see them bringing their children for Jesus to bless them. And man, as a parent, we have to consistently bring our children to Jesus. Praying for them. Praying for their salvation. Praying for God's will in their life. Praying for them to obey God and follow God. Praying that they would marry a Christian spouse. Praying for them over and over, continually bringing them to the Lord. Sincere faith. But sincere faith means that love must be sincere as well, as it says in Romans 12, 9. We have to love our children without conditions. The love for your child should never be attached to their performance. Whether it's grades or sports or anything else, they should know, hands down, that you love them for who they are regardless. Regardless. It has to be an unconditional love that is based on the love that God has for you. Love must be sincere, without hypocrisy. But also this, I think this is amazing. You know, Paul says in in 2 Timothy, right after he talks about the sincere faith, Paul tells Timothy to rekindle, to stir up the gift of God that is within him. That reminds me of something. You know, as godly parents, God puts upon us this responsibility to see the giftedness within each one of our children, the gift that He has put in them. Now, we are very good, we are very good at spotting when our kids do wrong. I mean, we can tell them in a heartbeat what not to do, right? Don't do this, don't do that. You're this and you're that. Constantly own them about what they're not doing. But how often are we catching them and constantly on them about what they're doing right? How disciplined are we to look within them to see the gift of God that He has put in them and to encourage that gift and to stir that gift up in them? Telling them, hey, you are gifted. God has gifted you in this way. You are to use that to glorify God. You are to use that to help other people. You are to use that gift within you that I see. You are to use that to honor God with your life. It's a responsibility for us to see their giftedness and to stir it up, to remind them why they have it. But then also a sincere faith, listen to this, practices the presence of Jesus. It practices the presence of Jesus. In other words, it displays an awareness of the presence of Christ daily. It makes Jesus a part of every conversation. It makes Jesus a part of instruction. It makes Jesus a part of comfort and care. It makes Jesus a part of discipline. I think about my grandmother Donald, and we'd be sitting around the table. It could be breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It didn't matter. Somebody would call. They would have a prayer need. They would have a prayer request. They would be telling Donald. Donald gets off the phone, and Donald says, we got to pray for Joe. We got to pray for so You stopped everything, and you prayed for them right there, practicing the presence of Jesus. You lost your car keys? Mama Donald's going to stop and pray for you to find them, practicing the presence of Jesus. You o- open up her calendar that was by the by the commode sometimes you'd find it in the living room and you'd find your name on the days that she prayed for you the name of other family members the other things that she prayed for practicing the presence of Jesus it's a part of sincere faith he is an active part of your life and then the last thing about sincere faith is this that we have to trust 
the Lord. We have to trust the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We can't control everything, but we can trust God to do His work in all things in our children's life and lead and guide them. In a sincere faith, your children seeing your sincere faith in Jesus in you is the biggest influence. They need to see the gospel with skin on. It's impossible to be perfect. It's impossible to ensure every outcome. But it is possible for you to walk with a sincere faith and live out a sincere faith. It is possible for your kids to see Jesus in you, and that will make the biggest difference. You know, the most important issue, the most important issue in the lives of our children is not them just being good people. It's not them becoming who you want them to be. The most important issue in the life of your child is for them to know Christ as their Savior and for them to live out the will of God in their life. For them to be who God wants them to be, not who you want them to be. That's the most important thing. And the only way that that's an influence is if you have a sincere faith and you're becoming the person God wants you to be. The second thing I want you to see is this. Not only is a godly influence about a, require a sincere faith, a godly influence involves a devotion to the Scriptures. A devotion to the Scriptures. Turn over a chapter with me there in 2 Timothy to chapter 3. Look in chapter 3 for me. Let's begin with verse 14. Paul says, But as for you, Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have, been, and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. From whom is plural, of course, and that relates to Lois and Eunice, his mother and his grandmother. You know from whom you've learned it. And look at verse 15. And how from infancy, from the time that you were born, from infancy, you have known the holy scriptures which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He would go on to say, for all scripture is God breathed, is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So how's the servant of God thoroughly equipped to be who God calls him to be? Through the scriptures. How are you instructed in the scriptures? Through your parents. Through your parents. Parents, you have, I have, we have the first responsibility of teaching the scriptures, of knowing the scriptures. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says there were two men. He gives a story. There were two men. But it relates to everyone because in that story, he says everyone who hears these words of mine, he says there are two men. And these two men wanted to build a house. And they both built a house. One built on the rock and one built on the sand. Then Jesus says a storm came. The rain came. The winds came. The waters rose. The hurricane came. And the house that was built on the rock withstood it all. But the house that was built on the sand, great was its fall. Now there's something we don't need to miss about that story. The two men... Both shared the same goal. They wanted to build a house. The two men both went to the same church. Now, how do I know that? Because in the story it says this. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So they, had one, they both had the same goal, build a house. They both went to the same church because they both heard the same word preached. They both lived in the same neighborhood because they both experienced the same storm that blew through. 
But what was the difference? The difference was the foundation that they chose to build upon. And what is that foundation? The foundation comes not from just information. The foundation comes not from just knowing what the Bible says. The foundation doesn't come from just showing up and listening to a sermon in church. The foundation comes when the Word is taken and when the Word is practiced in your life. That's where the foundation comes from. Now, let me ask you this question. I know, I know about building a house. You know that? I bet you know about building a house too. You know that the first thing you got to put down is what? Foundation. Right? The next thing goes up, you frame the walls, you frame those things up, you got to do the plumbing, you got to do the electrical work, then comes the sheet rock, then comes, you know, the roof, the rafters, all those types, uh, rafters, roof, all those types of things. Then comes the paint, then comes the details, then comes all of that, right? I know about building a house. I ain't never built one. Now my friend Turner, he builds houses. He knows about building houses. He knows what it means to lay a foundation. He knows what it means to frame. He knows everything about it. Who would you rather build your house, me or Turner? Because one, one of us practices it, the others just know about it. See, there's a lot of Christians that sit in the pew and they just know about it. They never practice it. And if you don't practice it, you don't have a foundation. You know, years ago, the Judeo-Christian values were very respected in our country. Even if as a whole, you know, people didn't really live by them, they were still respected. God was respected. That's no longer the case. You and I are living in a post-Christian America. There's an outright assault on biblical truth. From traditional marriage to Christian values to basic morality, there is a shift that's taken place in the foundation of our society. You can trace some of this back to, to 1962, 1963 and the Supreme Court rulings involving the separation of church and state where prayer was considered unconstitutional, where Bible reading in the school was considered unconstitutional. Moving on along in the 1980s, it was ruled that even a display of the Ten Commandments, not being taught, not being read, but just displayed on the wall was unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court's ruled that if the Ten Commandments was displayed upon the wall, a student might walk by, a student might read it, a student might meditate on it, and a student might obey it, and therefore it's unconstitutional. Today, 60-something percent of Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. Now, a lot of this started in the 1960s from prayer to Bible reading, all this being removed from school and infiltrating our schools and our children with secularism. How about the result of that? Let's just look at a broad picture. Now, we don't be too specific. A broad picture of the effects of that from the 1960s to where we are today. The U.S. ranks number one in the modern world in teenage pregnancy. Pregnancy outside of marriage. Number one in divorce rates. Number one in violent crime and incarcerations. Since the 1960s, single parent homes have nearly tripled. And most of that is single mothers. And many of them have to work two jobs to take care of their kids because dads are missing. They're absent. Which is the biggest issue in our society. Unmarried couples living together has nearly has increased nearly 1,000% since then. And then you look at our young people. You look at the violence in our schools. You look at the amount of the number of our teenagers suffering from depression and anxiety and other mental health issues, as well as high suicide rates in teenagers and children. And I think the effects are pretty clear. When you remove the moral foundation 
you see a great crash. That reminds us as Christians, your children are not going to get the foundation in our school system. Not in our public school system. Your children aren't going to get the foundation from watching Disney Plus or Nickelodeon or any other place. Your children are going to get a foundation from you. They're going to get the foundation that you lay. And if you only know about that foundation, if you only know about it but you don't practice it, guess what kind of foundation they're going to get? They're going to get the foundation that you give them. We need to get back to the foundation. We need to strengthen our foundation of knowing and doing the Word of God. Like it or not, your children know what's important to you. They see it in your life. They see it in how you live. They watch what you do. They hear what you say. They observe what you watch. They take note of what you listen to. If they see you on your phone all the time, always on social media, always in front of the TV, always posting, always doing this, always doing that, but they never see you in the Scriptures, they never hear you sharing the Scripture, they never see you applying the Scripture, they know your foundation. And they're learning how to lay the same foundation. If you don't live by it, you don't really believe it. If you don't really believe it, you don't pass it on. And ultimately, you pass on and you instill that which is in you and that which you really believe. That's why, listen to me, that's why you choose Turner to build your house instead of me. Because he does it. He practices it. He knows it. I just know about it. What foundation are you giving your children? Lois and Eunice were devoted to the Scripture, and they were a godly influence laying a foundation of faith in Timothy's life. You know, I, I think about, I had a wonderful mother, two wonderful grandmothers, and my, my mom, O'Donnell, boy, she loved the Scriptures. At night, when, when I'd spend the night with her, we'd go to bed, she would teach me Psalm 23. She would teach me the Lord's Prayer, and she'd tell me scary bedtime stories so that I needed them. I mean, she was good at that. At breakfast time, we had the Upper Room, which was a devotional book, United Methodist devotional book. We had that every breakfast. You had eggs, you had bacon, you had biscuits, and you had the Upper Room. Somebody read it. Throughout the day, when I was growing up as a child, things would happen, things would take place. You would have a conflict with your cousin or whatever that might come along the way. She reminded us of verses of Scripture. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's better to give than it is to receive. She'd quote that a lot. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I always remembered this one. And she would say it regularly. A good name is better than great riches. You know, there were three preachers who were discussing the Bible translations and which one was the best. And one preacher said that his favorite translation was the King James Version. It was so poetic, it was historic. The other said, well, I like the NIV version because it's readable, it's easy to understand. And the third preacher said, well, honestly, I like my mother's translation the best. She lived it out for me to see every day. A godly influence requires a devotion to Scripture. Lois and Eunice didn't have a perfect family situation. But because of their sincere faith and their devotion to the Scripture, they laid a foundation for Timothy's life. He came to believe. They trusted the Lord's will over Timothy's life, and they instilled the Word of God in him as a young man. And God did the rest. God did the rest. It reminds me of Proverbs 22.6. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he'll not depart from it. That's a godly influence. Sincere faith, a devotion to the Scriptures. It's impossible for you to do a perfect job. 
or to ensure a perfect outcome, but it is possible for you to live with a sincere faith and seek first the kingdom of God. It is possible for you to be devoted to the scriptures and to lay a foundation in your relationships and in your life. Train up a child in the way he should go. But listen to me. This is very sobering. You can't lead a child in the way he should go unless you're going that way. You can't lead your child where you have not been. Not possible. Your child can only grow to that point that they've seen you grow. You can't lead them where you haven't been. You can't help them lay a foundation if Jesus and His Word is not your foundation. You can't just know about it. It has to be a part of who you are through a sincere faith. The good news is this. When God speaks to our heart, God gives us an opportunity to repent of the ways that we've made mistakes or that we've messed up And God's grace is sufficient in so many ways for so many things. We have opportunity, if we're not going in the way that we should go, that we can lead our children, we have an opportunity to turn around and return to the faith that God calls us to and to recommit to God's Word in our life and allow God to work in and through us. Isn't God God good? So this morning as we close our time together, which way are you going? Which foundation are you building upon? Because that is key. That is key to a godly influence in the life of your children and your grandchildren for years to come. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity we have. Lord, to look at your word, to study your word. Lord, to celebrate motherhood today, to celebrate Lord, your call on our life and to celebrate family and our children and our grandchildren. Lord, it's all from you. And Lord, we thank you for it and we love you for it. And Lord, I pray as as you speak to our hearts, Lord, I pray that we would be willing not only to hear your word, Lord, but to come to that point where we're seeking you first in our lives, where we're going in the way of Christ, the way that we should be going. So, Lord, that we can lead our children, we can train our children up in the way they should go because that's the way we're going. And, Lord, I pray that if we're not on that path today for every mother, every father, grandmother, grandfather, Lord, that today that we would come to that point of surrender to you and allow you, Lord, to be the Lord of our lives each and every day. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. If you will...